Hi, and welcome back to the channel. Have you ever tried to make an asynchronous stream in Swift concurrency? Maybe you have, maybe you haven't. You've tried that before Swift 5.9. You would have seen that the APIs to do this are rather inconvenient. On my blog, I have some articles where I go into that, so I'll link those down in the description. In this video, however, we're going to look at a newer approach that is released in Swift 5.9, so it's been around for a little while, but it makes creating async streams a lot more uh, convenient. Async streams are very commonly used when you're trying to bridge a callback-based or progress-based API that you had pre-Swift concurrency into the world of Swift concurrency. So it's really much a bridging API, and I would assume that you can build other things with it too, but my experience with it has been mostly in bridging stuff. But that's all besides the point. The point is to demo this new API to you. Before I do, I, I want to quickly show you the, the old stuff and from there, we're going to look at the new stuff. And lastly, I'm going to show you some gotchas and some problems that I've run into with using async streams in general, right? So these are not necessarily issues that you'll have with the new API. They're just issues that you'll have with async streams in general. So the old situation has two different approaches of making async streams. One of them looks a little bit like this, right? What you can see here is that we have uh, a closure that we pass to an initializer, nothing too special, and this closure is labeled unfolding. Now there's a closure here, and from that closure, we return a value. This closure that we provide is going to be called every single time that our stream is requested to produce a value. So if we're iterating over this screen with an async for loop, every time we receive a value, we're gonna use the value in a for loop, and then our closure will be called again. Inside of this closure, we can await stuff. It's an asynchronous closure. So if you're producing values on the fly and it's taking a while, then that makes a lot of sense to use uh, this unfolding closure approach. That said, if you're bridging existing code, th this is not convenient because we couldn't use this, for example, to bridge something like a delegate-based API where one method is being called or another method is called or a mix of multiple methods is being called to produce values and then you want to send stuff into your stream. So if that's the situation that you're in, you might be better off using this other approach that you're seeing right now. This approach is a little bit more complicated, and in the example uh, that we have here, you can see me using uh, an async stream, passing a closure to the initializer, and we're grabbing the continuation that's passed to the closure and setting that on our location provider object. This object could be used to bridge an existing location provider that uses combine or anything else into the world of async await. The code in itself doesn't look that complicated or that crazy, but that optional that sits right there in the closure, those are the parts that are improved with async streams make stream method. So let's just dig right in and look at the implementation of the same object except based on async stream make stream. Right here, you can see that I have my make stream in place. And instead of having an optional var and a lazy var, I now have two let properties. So that's a lot cleaner. Inside of the initializer for this object, I'm creating my pair of stream and continuation in a single line of code. So that's really nice, a lot nicer than having to pass a closure, have the closure, accept the continuation, and then lift the continuation out of the closure to assign it to the object. That was never pretty. And everything else here looks pretty much the same, right? So we're still yielding into the continuation. We're still uh, passing values into our stream in the exact same way as before. So those things didn't change. It's just the setup that's quite different. So when we have this in place and we're, start, we're starting to use it, there's going to be a couple of problems that we'll run into. So now that you've seen MakeStream and how it works, and really that's all that there is to show you on MakeStream, so it's really convenient, so really a lean API. I want to dig into a little bit of a demo at the computer where I show you how you can uh, build your own async stream that handles all of the gotchas surrounding memory management and lifecycle management in a very nice and clean way. So join me at the computer and we'll take a look at a little bit of a demo. So right here, what you can see is another location provider object. It's very similar to what we had before, except this one simulates location updates. 
right? So we have a location provider and a var locations that will actually just turn into a let right now because we don't need these to be vars, okay? Um, so we have this let locations and that locations let is our async stream. So that's what we're going to be iterating over to get values. We also have this private let continuation, which as you can see, it's not optional. It's a proper private let of type async stream continuation. And we're going to set that at initialization time. Right, this looks very similar to what you saw in the, the code snippet before. We used a stream uh, object or make stream function to get a tuple that has a stream and a continuation and we persist those. That's all great. We have some debug printing going on uh, because that's basically the main point of the demo that we can see when things go away and what happens. Then we have this start updates function here and that's used to simulate note location updates. Um, every second we're going to be publishing a new unique value. Um, if you were working with a location provider, then that you would have something similar, except then you're not doing this on a timer, you're doing this when locations become available. And every second, we're going to push a new UUID into our stream. So this is all nothing too special. It very closely mimics what a location provider would look like, except this one's easy to, to mock into a playground. Now, to make things realistic, I also made a my view model, right? So imagine the situation where we have this view model and location provider, and we use that to drive a UI. So this my view model uses a location provider instance. It has a computed var for locations because we kind of want to hide that we're using something under the hood. Uh, some debug printing again, and whenever we initialize the view model, we're immediately going to start receiving updates. Right, so that's pretty um, pretty standard, I would say, pretty straightforward. Nothing too weird happening here. So let's go ahead and, and use this in an example that's somewhat realistic for what it might look like when you're using this stuff from a Swift UI view. So I make an instance of my view model. It's going to be optional so that I can nil it out later on. We will have this sample task here, which is just a plain task. And we grab the locations, uh, async stream, we print before the loop, we start doing a bunch of stuff, we print our locations that we receive, and then we print again after the loop. And we have a secondary task that sleeps for two seconds and then nils out our view model. So let's go on ahead and see what happens when we run this code. So you just saw something pop up, ignore that, because the actual result that we're waiting for will be here soon, hopefully. All right, so we ran the code just now. I had to cut a little bit because Xcode was being a little bit weird, so you didn't see this code run, but we can see now that we have before the for loop gets printed, then we see a will sent printed, printed because that's what we call here. Then we see our location being printed or rather a UUID in this case. We see that happen twice because we do it once every second and then we see view model is gone, location provider is gone. So we know that both our view model and our location provider got deallocated. However, What's strange about what's happening here is that we never exit our for loop. We never leave it. So I would have expected to see after the for loop here, but that's not the case. And the reason for that is even though we, we deinitialize our uh, view model and location provider, this for loop here does not end when that happens. There's nothing canceling it. And at the same time, our continuation never calls its finish method. So we can fix this rather easily by writing continuation.finish. And if we run the code again, and we see the output, we should now be able to see that our for loop also ends as expected. All right, so we see before loop and after loop printed exactly how we wanted it. So we fixed that problem here where our continuation does not finish if we don't explicitly finish it. Uh, it doesn't finish when its owner goes out of scope or anything like that. So the continuation can kind of stick around or go away. It doesn't matter. It doesn't finish. It doesn't automatically finish, which is something that we are used to from combine. You just don't have it in async stream. Now, a second scenario that might happen is maybe you're not deinitializing your view model, but instead you might cancel your task. If we do this, our for loop is going to end, but we've not, we won't do the cleanup that we want to do. So I'm gonna go on ahead and run this. And we'll look at the output. And what we'll see is 
before for loop will send will send again after for loop but we keep getting these will sends all right so our for loop ended we know that we're no longer iterating and everything is completed our task cancellation actually caused our for loop to end but we did not end our uh, cancelable here. So we did not stop our location updates. If you were doing this with a CL location provider or CL location manager, uh, you would see that you keep receiving location updates. So in this case, what we want to do is leverage a continuations on termination closure so that we can actually cancel our location updates whenever uh, our iteration over the for loop ends. So in this case, that means that we can write continuation continuation dot on termination equals receives an argument we're not interested in that right now and all that we want to do is set the cancelable to nil and of course we will need to do that on a instance of self and to avoid memory leaks we'll say weak self all right so this will not cause our location provider to actually go out of scope or anything like that but it will allow us to cancel the uh, receiving of location updates. So before the for loop, will send is called twice, and then after for loop, and then we see no more calls to will send. And so these are two gotchas surrounding the life cycles of async streams that I really wanted to show you in a demo here because they're harder to explain and it's important to see them in action. All right, to recap, the first problem we saw is if we uh, nail out our view model, so if that goes out of scope, the location provider goes out of scope, and our continuation goes out of scope, yet we are left with a dangling for loop. And that might not sound like a huge deal, but you are also going to have a task that is sitting there and waiting for values to become available indefinitely. If you have enough of these tasks, you're eventually going to starve the system from resources and you'll run into problems where your app is simply going to freeze. So you want to keep an eye on this and you've just seen how you can test it. Just nil out your view models and have some printing around your for loops and you'll know exactly which ones are left dangling. The second problem you saw is if the task itself gets canceled, which you might see happening if you're starting uh, for loops inside of a SwiftUI task view modifier. And maybe you're not cleaning up your resources if your for loop ends. To fix that, if you're building an async stream with continuations, set a on termination closure on that continuation because that will allow you to perform cleanup work as the termination, as the for loop terminated, as the for loop iteration is terminated. That was a mouthful. Um, so that's the two situations to really be aware of that you'll need to get right. Luckily, this, the, the fixes are not that hard, but these are very easy to miss problems. Let's go wrap it up. So in this video, you have seen how you can leverage Swift uh, Concurrency's async streams mixed stream method to build your own asynchronous streams. This, this is an approach that's incredibly useful when you're building your own WebSocket iterators or when you're bridging location providers or other uh, almost combined-like situations where you're going to be doing some stuff over time and you want to have control over how and when these values are published. I've also shown you two scenarios in which you will have to perform some custom work to make sure that you're not running into any problems and to make sure that you're uh, cleaning up after yourself, not having memory leaks, managing lifecycle and all of that. Now, in the description down below, I will have several links for you surrounding async sequences and async streams that link back to my blog because I've written quite a little bit about async sequences. Now, if you're not subscribed to the channel, please hit that subscribe button. Don't forget to like the video and do all of the things that makes the algorithm happy. And then I'll see you in the next one. Thanks for watching.